I'm back with another memory video. These ones kept me busy for quite some time now. Those are 30 pin SIM modules with one megabyte each and they fit perfectly in my 386 board, but they are only four megabytes in total. And that may be enough for a 386, but I like to push this old hardware sometimes to the limits. And as we learned in one of my previous videos, this board is capable of addressing 64 megabytes. But before we reached 64 megabytes, there was another project in between. Those are 4 megabyte SIM modules. They were built by PCBWay, who is also the sponsor of today's video. And you can find the revision of this PCB online thanks to UpletGeek, who made them available for everyone to download on his GitHub page. With 8 of those modules, I could get this board to 32 megabytes. But if you look up the specification of 30 pin SIM modules, you will read that they support a maximum capacity of 16 megabytes. That is 4 times the capacity of those modules. So my goal was to build 16 megabyte SIM modules. And the outcome? Where are those modules? I made a full video about those modules and you can watch it in the top right corner if you haven't seen it already. Now the challenge with those modules is... The memory chips. It is quite difficult to find those high capacity memory chips and they need to be in the right memory configuration and they must support FPM mode in order to work on this motherboard. If you have seen some of my previous videos, you know that there is a simple trick how to turn EDO memory chips into FPM memory chips or at least make them behave like FPM memory chips. And that is the reason why we have this little switch on the top. But there is another problem with those memory chips and some of you pointed this out. They are rated for 3.3 volts. Now we do have voltage regulators on those PCBs, but they are only regulating the power supply of those memory chips. The signal lines are directly connected to the chipset. And the chipset may communicate with 5 volt signal lines. So technically we operate those memory chips out of spec. And this is clearly mentioned in the datasheet. I spent quite some time doing research, trying to figure out what would be a solution, talk to experts, and today I want to share with you all the struggles I went through and hopefully also to give you a small glimpse of what is to come because I have one memory module ready that is supposed to be fully compliant with the datasheet of those memory chips. So how I did end up with this memory module will come in this video. Unfortunately, I needed more space and I had to populate on the back also some components, but we will get to this later. So I want to share with you what I had to go through to end up with this solution. And there was actually another project in between, which ended up in a failed PCB that didn't work. And this was also built by PCBWay. Thank you so much for being patient with me. Um, we will try this anyway. We will see how this one behaves. There will be also some new solder techniques which will not involve hot air, but they will involve a stencil and solder paste. So this one was quite interesting. And I will also share with you some equations. Yes, we will see some math today. And this was absolutely necessary for me to understand how memory modules and signal lines work. And I hope you find that interesting. So the first thing I will do is we will install those one megabyte SIM modules in the motherboard and then I'm going to use a oscilloscope to just probe around a little bit and see what kind of voltages arrive on those pins. So as I understand, older systems like this communicate with five volt data lines. And this was kept for quite some time and then the 30 pin SIM modules were replaced with 72 pin SIM modules, but the standard remained at five volts for the memory chips. Only later, when SD memory arrived, the voltage was dropped to 3.3 volts. But as it is sometimes with technology that is overlapping, you will get a mix of technologies. So that is probably why those memory chips are available for 3.3 volts. And if you have seen the memory PCBs where those modules came on, it is actually a 168 pin memory module. So if 72 pin memory modules are made for 5 volts, how can it then be that we have identical memory chips on this 72 pin module, like the memory chips that were on the 168 pin memory module? They are from Micron, 
and they are rated for 3.3 volts. If this 72 pin memory module was made for 5 volts, how were they able to get away with only one voltage regulator? This is only for the power supply. How come the rest of the data lines are not protected by anything? Well, and the reason is that newer chipsets actually reduce this signal voltage from 5 volts to around 3 volts. This information is sometimes available in the chipset documentation. If it's not given, the chipset may communicate with 5 volt data lines. But to know for sure, you probably have to measure the pins on the memory chips. An example would be the HX chipset from Intel that is used on the ASUS P55T2P4. In the documentation is written that this chipset is communicating with the memory at 3 volts. But now let's get back to our board here and try to see what voltage arrives on our memory chips. So for this test I will be installing those four memory modules and then we will test with an oscilloscope what voltage is arriving on those memory chips. I don't think it's possible to use a multimeter to do the same test because of the high frequency that those memory modules operate at and you will not get a proper reading. And I also don't want to just boot this PC up because I want some activity on the memory chips. So I'll put this on my test bench and then we are going to boot into memtest86. And while it's running the test, we are going to measure the voltage that arrives on those memory chips. So, see you in a moment. Before I start measuring some values on the chip, let's just see what type of signals arrive on the memory chip. If I would have to categorize those signals, I would probably group them in three different types. The first one marked in orange here are data pins. Those signals are the only ones that are bidirectional. That means signals can be sent from the memory controller on the motherboard to the memory chip and vice versa. Then we have the address pins. Those are unidirectional and are only sent from the memory controller to the memory chip. And finally there are control signals, the CAS, RAS and write enable. We also have an output enable pin, but this one is not routed through the memory socket. I do however use it for my EDO to FPM memory mod. Those last four signals are also unidirectional, meaning they are only being sent from the memory controller to the memory chip. Because those memory chips are quite small and the memory chips are oriented horizontally, I will probably only have access to a few of those pins. The other ones are too close to the motherboard and I will not have enough space to get with the probe in there. So I will probably only measure two of the data pins, which is pin 24 and 25 here on the diagram, or the data pins 3 and 4. We have access to the CAS line. I will skip output enabled because this one is just tied to CAS for the FPM mod that is enabled. And then we have five data lines, A4 till A8, which we also can measure. So now let's go ahead and measure some signal voltages. Pin number one is here on the bottom, so we'll not touch this one. We start with a second from the left here. We need to get the second pin. And this one is reaching 5 volts top. Let's see the second one. The second data pin. Okay, here we have 4.8, 5 volts probably. So this is definitely out of spec for the high capacity memory chips. Let's check the first data pin one more time. Here we go, 5 volts max voltage. Okay. Next, uh, this one here is the CAS line. This one here is the output enabled. We will not touch these because unfortunately when I touch these pins with the probe, the capacitance increases and unfortunately memtest will stop functioning. So let's continue with the, with the five address pins here. 3.8 Okay, so we are not going past 4 volts as it looks like Okay Next one 3.8 as well I guess these ones are all running at 3.8 volts so it looks like the address pins are not accessed with more than 4 volts, which technically would be safe for the other memory chips, but if you have an idea why that is, 
Let me know in the comments. So let's see what happens when I touch the cusp pin with a probe of the oscilloscope. 4.8 volts. And if I am not mistaken, I don't see any changes on the test anymore. Yeah, I think this one crashed. So let me restart the test and uh, let's try again to probe the cast signal. Maybe I can show you how the capacitance of a oscilloscope probe is enough to disturb the signals on those memory chips and uh, will cause memory errors. Okay, so we are back in memtest. Let's try again and measure cusp signal. There we go. Immediately it stopped. So just by touching the memory pin, disturbing the signal with additional capacitance from the probe of the oscilloscope caused our system to crash. So what did we learn? The data pins are definitely accessed with a 5 volt signal voltage. The CAS line is also accessed with 5 volts. The address lines, however, seem to be accessed with a lower voltage. What I could measure was below 4 volts. So I'm not sure why that is. But I also know that for somebody else, the address pins are also accessed with 5 volts. So just because mine are accessed or seemingly being accessed with 3.8 or 4 volts is no guarantee that every chipset will behave the same way. So now that we have measured all these voltages, we know that we run the 16 megabyte SIM modules out of spec. And now it is time to figure out what can we do to fix it. So now comes the math section, but we are not going too deep into it. So let's just recall that we had two main types of data signals. One is a unidirectional signal. These were the address lines and the control signals. And we had the data lines. These were bidirectional. They were either sent from the memory controller to the memory chip or to get data back out, we have to send data from the memory chip to the memory controller. For now, we will not focus on the bidirectional signals. Let's first think about the ones that are only going to the memory module. And for those signals, I was thinking the easiest way to reduce the voltage is to use a voltage divider. And here you can see a picture how a voltage divider looks like. You have two resistors in series and uh, depending on their value, you get a reduced voltage in between both resistors. And we will not go and do some manual calculation. There are online tools. So we'll just put in some of the values that we know. So we have the source voltage, which in our case is 5 volts, and we want to have a voltage out of 3.3. This is within the maximum ratings that this chip can endure. Now, we will not be able to calculate this yet. We need to have at least one more resistor given. So let's just, uh, let's say 100 ohms, and we get another resistor here. Uh, calculated that if you want to get 3.3 volts, we need around 200 ohms for the second one. So R1 will be 100 and the second one uh, should be around 200 and then we will get a voltage between both resistors of 3.3 volts in relation to ground. Let's have a look at a simulation. This is a tool that was recommended to me. It can simulate electrical circuits and signals. We will also be able to measure voltages on electrical components, like our memory chip. In this electrical circuit, our memory chip is represented by this capacitor with 7 picofarad. That was not my design choice, but it makes a lot of sense, because each of the pins on the memory chip has an internal capacitance. If you look at the datasheet, you will see that any pin except for the address pins have an internal capacitance of 7 picofarad. So this circuit should be an accurate representation of our voltage divider circuit that we want to build, including our memory chip. The voltage divider is already in place, but it doesn't have the correct values yet. But that doesn't matter. Let's start the simulation. So you see that we have a nice square wave signal here, which goes up and down. And uh, this is based on the 33 megahertz that we are given here on the top. 
and we can see here that the maximum volt here with this voltage divider this is just um, values that i picked for now we get around 4.4 4.5 volts so if we go back to our voltage divider here we see that r1 should be 100 and the second uh, resistor should be 200 so let's just update this 100 and the second one is 200 and let's reset our simulation and you can see on our voltmeter we are exactly getting 3.3 volts so this is basically a simple solution to reduce the voltage in a circuit but there are a lot of other issues and you know that i'm not an expert so what happens if this is a higher load it requests it requires more uh, current to flow and so on and then the entire circuit may be out of balance and you can already see that this circuit consumes about 16 milliamps that is a lot if you think about that it's just one of the pins on the memory chip so if we have what we have 12 address lines so if you multiply this by 12 then you're at about 200 milliamps and this will be partially converted into heat and this has to go somewhere um, maybe this is too much stress on the memory chip or on the memory controller so if you want to reduce this we can use ohm's law to maybe figure out what resistance we have to have in our circuit to reduce the drawn current right now those two resistors are in series and we just add them together and we would end up with 300 ohms so if we go ahead and we say here we have a voltage of 5 volts input, uh, current we want to calculate, we have 300 uh, resistance. We can calculate these two and I'm expecting the current to be 16. Yes, so this is exactly this what we have here shown in our simulation. So if we want to reduce this, we can go ahead and uh, maybe say what would be the resistance, the series resistance, if we just want 5 milliamps. Uh, let's get rid of the resistance as well. So now we should calculate these two values and it says 1000. So in total we have 1000 ohms or 1 kilo ohm in our circuit. So we should get around 5 milliamps if we have a series resistance of 1000 ohms and if we remain with a split of 1 to 2 then would be something like 333 and 660. So we can just probably go ahead with 300 and 600 that would be that would be enough. And you can see we still get our 3.3 volts here. But something is happening to our signal. It's no longer this nice square wave that we had before. The rising edge is rounded and no longer pointy. So something to understand why this electrical signal looks like this and not like the square one we have seen before is because of the capacitance that is here. When there is electricity flowing into the capacitor, it will basically first absorb it and slowly charges. It, it doesn't allow the voltage to be there immediately. This 3.3 volts that we are trying to achieve is not there immediately. First, the capacitance has to be overcome. And uh, even though it's a seemingly small capacitance, it is enough to cause the electrical signal to deteriorate into this, what we see here, like this jigsaw. And the reason is simply the resistor. This resistor prevents the current to flow fast enough to charge the capacitance and create a nice square wave signal. Unfortunately, when I worked on the second module, I ignored the shape of the square wave. For me, the drawn current was the main concern, and I decided to reduce this current even further. And the only way I can do this is to increase the resistance. I ended up with a value of R1 of 1 kilo ohm and R2 became 3.3 kilo ohms. That's great, because it will reduce the current by quite a bit. But the signal is no longer an electrical signal. Unfortunately, the voltage divider doesn't seem to be a good solution for the address and signal lines, especially not with those resistances. But what about the bidirectional signal? The data lines. So for our 8 data lines, we need a level translator or level shifter. Sometimes I think it's also called a buffer chip. 
I was recommended to use this LSF0108, which has 8 channel bidirectional multi voltage level translation for open drain and push pull application. Now, this is a mouthful of stuff, and I will not be able to explain it properly because I also don't understand it very well, so I'd rather not get into this. But what's important? So, first of all, this chip is able to switch at high frequencies. This is very important. It allows us to level translate from 5 volts to 3.3 volts, which is great. This is exactly what we need. This is. But let's quickly see the pinout. So. We have an A side and we have a B side. On the B side, we are supposed to connect the data lines of the memory controller on the motherboard. And on the A side, we are supposed to connect the data pins of the memory chips. And then you have to hook up some of the reference voltage. So here, for instance, voltage reference of side B, this will be the 5 volts. And voltage reference A, this will be the 3.3 volts that are powering our memory chips. These voltages are required for the level shifter to work properly. What is important is that this is a bidirectional level shifter, which means it can translate into both directions, which we require for our data pins, without having any kind of control pin, like which direction it should translate. It does that automatically. So... This is great because it reduces the complexity of the circuit quite a bit. But another unfortunate mistake I made in revision 2.0 was that I didn't understand what push-pull versus open-drain means. I implemented the LSF0108 with push-pull in mind, but that was apparently a mistake. But let's forget this for now and just assemble the memory module. Just to be clear, we are going to assemble a defective memory module, but I want to share with you the journey I had to go through. Without the help of PCBWay, I wouldn't be able to show you all this. And this time, I also got a stencil for the PCB. Since there are so many SMD components, I thought I'd give solder paste and the stencil a try this time. And I have to say that I don't regret this choice, even though the project was not really successful. PCBWay also extended their 10th year anniversary celebration, so if you haven't already done so, head over to PCBWay.com and check out their 10th year anniversary tour. There you can find exclusive coupons and win some prizes. And of course, if you're in need of PCBs, sheet metal fabrication, CNC machining or 3D printing, head over to PCBWay.com. The links are in the video description. This solder technique is quite interesting, don't you think? It was so nice to see the solder paste melt and move the SMD components into place. It wasn't perfect, I still ended up with a few solder bridges, but I can easily fix them with a soldering iron. It definitely will take a lot more time if you have to solder all these small resistors by hand, so I don't regret to go with the solder paste and the stencil. And here is the final PCB, fully assembled. But as I pointed out before, I made some mistakes designing these circuits. So don't get excited, this memory module will not work properly. I only created one memory module of revision 2.0, because first I wanted to verify if it actually works. So I paired it with three memory modules of the previous batch.
But the monitor stayed blank and there was also no sound from the speakers, no beep codes and no memory count. But then it got interesting. I decided to rotate the modules around and put the new module in first position. And suddenly... Can you believe it? It booted! But I don't know why. And this is true for the first three sockets. If I place the new module in one of those sockets, the system seems to work. I can even boot into Windows. This installation of Windows 3.1 is entirely running from memory. This is the RAM disk version. I made a video about this some time ago. However, we shouldn't get too excited about this memory module. As I said before, there are issues on it and I only noticed after I built the PCB. Memtest 86 Plus will always fail at the same position. And I think I tried this at least 10 times. So even though this memory module and all the work I put into this may be a failure, I learned quite a bit. And this is where my second attempt comes into play. Well, technically it's my third attempt because I already created these black modules. There are two major changes in this version. First, I got rid of all voltage dividers. Instead, I'm using also LSF0108s. So not only our data signals are translated by the level shifter, we also translate the address pins and the signal lines. But as we know now, these signals are only unidirectional. So they are always translated from 5 volts to 3.3 volts. And the second major change is that I implemented all three LSF0108s in open drain configuration. And that is why I needed a few more components on the back of the PCB. I simply didn't have enough space on the front. But the explanation for this has to wait for another video. Unfortunately, I was only able to create one memory module of the new batch. And this is because I ran out of SMD components. I need more resistors and capacitors and LSF0108s. And only then can I verify that four of the new modules will actually work in a 386 system. But the good news is that the new module is working in combination with three of the original modules. Memtest 86 Plus passed a full cycle, that is 10 hours of memory test. So yeah, today's video is more like a progress report I guess, where I am with the design of the new memory modules. Well, now you definitely know that I'm working on it, and I will only publish the PCBs when I'm 100% sure that they are working. So just be a little bit more patient, and once I verify that the new modules are working, I will publish the PCBs on PCBWay.com. And I'm sorry if this video was a little bit back and forth here and there, but yeah, it was quite a difficult topic for me. And now let me know in the comments what you think about this project, and <laughs> if you have some suggestions, ideas, or improvements, that would be welcomed. So thank you for your time watching this video and thanks to all my Patreons for their invaluable support. See you next time.